So we have been learning about the life, ministry and message of Jesus Christ and we were talking about the pre-existent Christ and then we have been uh, talking about, thinking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ and uh, why incarnation was necessary and what is the purpose of incarnation and what are the lessons we are learning from incarnation. Finally we said through incarnation we understand the truth that God is able to save and also he is willing to save. And incarnation was essential for the perfection of our salvation. That's what we learned in the last session that salvation when it is not just a one minute thing. In fact, you know, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, the truth is that we are saved as if we have entered into a safe house. Maybe the lion is outside, but when you have entered the door, when you are in and the door is closed and the, the lion is outside and the lion can do nothing, like those who are in Jesus Christ, for them there is no condemnation. So your salvation is assured when you are in. But that is not the end of the story. Again, you are walking towards the glory which is awaiting for us in heaven. And we walk and this path is known as the path of uh, sanctification. So we are justified by the death of Jesus Christ. And uh, that is like a door. Jesus said, I am the door. And when we enter through the door, you are saved. But still you are walking in the path of uh, sanctification in each point of this travel or the journey don't think that we are imperfect of course we are perfect and we need to be perfect as we are but at the same time a perfection is awaiting for us and finally we need to reach that perfect salvation this is the process of salvation I told you the first one is the positional salvation and then the process of salvation and finally glorification the perfect salvation see so um, what God offers us is the life of Jesus Christ and what God requires of us is the life of Jesus Christ and uh, the source of our target or our target is the source, the life of Jesus Christ. And the source for us to reach that target, it is also the life of Jesus Christ. So now we have uh, learned something about the incarnation or the need and purpose of incarnation. But now come uh, to the second part of our study, that is the historical Jesus. We have entered uh, into the next session and that is the historical Jesus. We have seen Jesus as the Alpha and Omega, the pre-existent Christ, the eternal word who was with God and he is the cause of all creation. In fact, you know, it is written the firstborn of all creation, but I told you that is not firstborn because don't think that he is born like we have been born into this world. It's not like that. The, when we say he is the son, he represents God or Something like he is revealing God and that's the reason why Jesus is the son of God. It's not a genetical uh, birth. Don't uh, consider it as a genetical. Like, of course, Jesus was born into this world. And that time, in fact, you know, he was, re God was revealing himself in the flesh. That's all. He's incarnated in the flesh. It was the revelation of God. Okay. It was a revelation of God. So he is the cause of all creation. And the very God incarnated in the flesh and dwelt among us and that God was Jesus of Nazareth. God, Jesus, when you look at Jesus on, of Nazareth, you are not seeing somebody other than God or a man who was pleasing God or just a man or just a God. He is, of course, is God Yahweh. He is God Yahweh. You understand? It's the eternal God. But now we see him as Jesus of Nazareth. So God incarnated or revealed or invaded this planet earth. But it was not, uh, don't think that it was an accident or something happened at a time of history. Of course it happened but you know it was not an accidental thing. 
there was a lot of preparation for the invasion preparation from the from god side god side means you know god was preparing the earth the people the religion everything so that people will understand or you know when he is invading the planet earth people should be you know uh, accept him accept him means you know he was preparing for this that incarnation preparing people for that incarnation so now in the first session we are learning about the preparation for incarnation see great preparation was there for the incarnation of god into this planet first of all god was promising his invasion or incarnation from the very beginning of history the first preparation is the promises god made to mankind and uh, uh we know that the fall of man fall of man means fall of adam it made the mankind a slave to sin earlier he was not a slave to sin but from adam onwards when he fell into sin he was yielding to temptation that time onwards all the mankind has some kind of uh, inclination towards sin and even when man didn't want to do sin he was falling into sin or something like it was a slavery so uh, god really wanted to redeem man from sin redemption was in the mind of god as we have seen yesterday it was not after the fall of man god was discussing or deciding or thinking about the redemption but even before everything was created even before the ages he was preparing or you know he was doing something he had something in his mind the incarnation was not something that god was planning after the fall but he has planned it even before the ages okay so uh, redemption was essential and in the old testament we see that god is always promising a messiah to the mankind god's god is promising and also man was expecting a messiah so this session we are looking at the at god's messianic promises and man's messianic expectations you understand the difference god's messianic promises and man's messianic expectations you get me my friends so from our part we were expecting our forefathers were expecting a messiah who would redeem them from the enemy okay and god was always promising them that i will send a messenger i will send a messiah to redeem you from your sins the first promise of the messiah is given in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the first messianic promise was given to adam and eve in the book of genesis chapter 3 verse 15 what was the messianic promise genesis chapter 3 verse 15 i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise the head and you shall bruise his heel the seed of woman shall bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman so the first promise is that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent so serpent was their enemy okay so the promise that god's promise was that he her seed would bruise the head of the enemy and thus once the head is bruised then you are free right you are if you are if the head of your enemy is bruised or destroyed then certainly you are freed so god wanted to redeem them free them from the clutches of sin and them they understood that their enemy was sin so the first promise of the messiah was not a political redemption or redeemer but it was a redeemer who will redeem them from the clutches of serpent who cause sin into this world okay but later we understand that 
this understanding of uh, understanding was not carried out by the jewish people the promise of uh, promise was that the seed of woman will bruise the head of the serpent and this promise again god was giving to all the forefathers like abraham in chapter 12 genesis chapter 12 verse 2 i will make you a great nation a blessed nation god promises abraham a blessed nation okay because he says abraham leave your country your kindred and your father's house and go to the the land that i will show you i will make you a great nation i will bless you and you shall be a blessing so god wanted a god wanted to bless abraham so that he will be a cause for a blessed nation through the seed of course uh, i will make you a great nation and now uh, a a promise is pronounced to abraham and we see that this promise that time may not abraham abraham was not knowing about messiah and all you understand many times that's the problem with the old testament prophets a pro- prophecy and prophets even when god speaks about the messiah those people might not understand that it says about messiah even i do not know whether even adam when adam was uh, given a promise that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent uh, she might not or he might not think about what messiah is coming and all it's the same with abraham abraham was given a, a promise that uh, through his seed a great nation a blessed nation i tell it a blessed nation because then comes the the promise of blessing i will bless you so that you shall be a blessing and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed okay so this was a blessed nation god was promising a blessed nation through his seed but he thought it is about his own sons born to uh, him through zara or somebody else but in galatians chapter 3 verse 16 when we read there something that abraham could not understand paul says that when he saith or giving promise to adam he saith not and to his seeds as many as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is christ so god was not giving the promise of seeds but a seed what does it mean paul says it was not about many people but it says about one seed one seed and peter paul says it is the christ you understand me abraham had many sons but promise is given only to one son that is isaac it says about one person but even when it was applied for one person it was also applied for the future messiah that is christ this is the special thing we need to understand about old testament prophecies old testament prophecies when we hear it we need to understand that there are uh you hear okay when the old testament prophecies there is a fulfillment for those days something is happening some promise is given and that happens in that age and also that happens to the messiah and also sometimes that happens to us so many times there are a three faceted fulfillment of a prophecy in the old testament something that is promised to the old testament people that happens to them in their life itself it is fulfilled and of course many times it is fulfilled in the life of the messiah 
and many times it is extended to the eschatological or the last days you get me i will tell you an example see in psalms 22 we read about the death of jesus christ or a, some kind of experience some kind of feeling that god has abandoned the person i certainly believe that it was applicable for the person who wrote it first of all that person also had the feeling that god abandoned him sometimes the problem with us now when we read a passage we say it is a messianic passage but in those days they did not understand that it is a messianic passage but that day they had some kind of fulfillment maybe it is not in full but some kind of fulfillment in that promise god gives to them and also it is applicable for the messiah and it is also applicable for you and me the samis felt that he was abandoned by god when jesus was on the cross he also had the same feeling that he was abandoned by god and i tell you sometimes we also will feel that we are abandoned by god so when we are ascribing a passage for the messiah don't think that it is applicable only for the messiah you get my point but it must be fulfilled completely in the life of messiah partially in the life of the prophet or the people who are living in his time you get me and it is possible that this promise is extended to a an age that is the eschatological time or the end times or even in eternity take the case of sabbath that's what we see in hebrews those who believe a time for sabbath is still kept for them sabbath or the rest was given to the people of israel when they reached the land of canaan okay but that promise is extended to us and we will that will be fulfilled in our life only when we reach heaven so whenever we read an old testament prophecy remember it is possible it's not about all the prophecies it is possible that the promise is fulfilled in their life and in the life of the messiah or even in our life sometimes it happens in eternity the promise has a three phase set that's the reason why i say it a three phase set thing at the time of the promise maybe it uh it it be fulfilled in their life in the life of the messiah and in the coming time so paul says this promise was fulfilled in the life of uh abraham of course abraham god promised him a son right a seed and he experienced he 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 got a son he got a son but paul says that was not just for isaac the promise was not just for isaac it was a promise for messiah also and that's the reason why he says it is christ god says that's the reason he said not and to his seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is christ which is christ paul says it is of christ it is not just of isaac but it prom it fulfilled in the life of isaac also right you understand this promise was fulfilled in the life of isaac also isn't it yes but that was not the end of the story even that promise it was for isaac and also for christ so the promise in 2000 years ago god spoke to abraham about christ which abraham never understood 2000 years ago when paul was giving a promise 2000 years ago when god was giving a promise to 
Abraham, he never thought it is about Christ or Jesus. So many of the promises, the people who heard the promise could not understand what God was promising. But the promise was given. That's the thing. The promise was given uh, to the people. God promised the Messiah who would destroy the enemy and redeem man from uh, his captivity of sin. However, Israel uh, failed to understand the real meaning of the promise. Messiah would destroy the enemy. They understood that Messiah would come to destroy the enemy. But they failed to understand the enemy. That's the problem. The first promise was to, to Adam and Eve, right? And that time, who was the enemy? It was a serpent. And that's the reason why God said, your seed shall bruise the head of the serpent. And it is the serpent who caused sin in their life. So God was promising that he will send a seed to redeem them from their sins. Because they understood that their enemy was sin. But Israelites, when they became a nation, they never thought their enemy was sin. Because they were facing many other enemies, material, physical enemies like Philistines. So they thought God would send a Messiah to redeem them from the Philistines. So instead of seeing sin as an enemy, they started seeing the neighboring country as an enemy. You get my point? So all the life of Israel, they were expecting a Messiah who would redeem them from the neighboring country or the hostile country. Even in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1 onwards we read that they are asking for a king. The Israelites were asking for a king. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. And uh, verse 3, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after, after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice, that which Samuel never did. The sons of Samuel, Samuel appointed them as judges. That itself was a mistake. That, that is one of the mistakes. Sometimes I, I, I feel that this is the mistake most of the mission leaders are also doing. Uh, like, you know, uh, the leaders, the judges, the people should be, uh, what do you say, uh, appointed by, not by the existing leader, but by God. See, God appointed Samuel. Samuel has seen something happen in the life of Eli, right? Eli appointed his sons as, as priests. And that was a big mistake. Even after seeing that mistake, Samuel was appointing his sons as the judges. And these people came and said, we were happy with you because you never took bribe from us. You never turned uh, the righteousness. But your sons are not walking in thy ways. So we need, verse uh, 5, uh, before you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways, now appoint for us a king to govern us like the other nations. So this, what these people say is, if you think humanly, they were talking, they were asking a very uh, wise thing. And they say the other kings, other nations have a king. So what is the uh, privilege of having a king? When there is a battle, the king will take care of the battle. The problem with Israel, they did not have even an army, a, a trained army. When an enemy is coming, the Philistines are coming, they are calling, Hey, Joshua! Hey! Oh! Uh, Moses! Oh! Uh, uh, Joseph! All of you, come! Come! Look! The Philistines have come! Yeah? Then there, have no, there is no arms or nothing. They take the stones and uh, logs of wood and things like that and trying to fight and they fail. Sometimes. Many times they did not fail, that's true. But many times they failed. They, when they failed, they thought it is because they did not have a leader to lead them and in the battle. And that's the, that is why, that is the reason why they were asking for a king. 
In eight, chapter 8, verse 20, uh, 20 to, uh, verse 20, it says that we also may be like the nations that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they had a reason why they need a king. What was the reason? They needed a king to go before them to fight the battle. So that is very rational and a reasonable thing, right? It's a reasonable thing. But uh, I was trying to explain, they always consider the neighboring country as enemies instead of seeing sin as the real enemy. So sometimes Philistines were their enemy. After some time, you know, uh, Syrians were the enemy. Some, after some time, Assyrians were the enemy. Then the Babylon was the enemy. Then again, Syrians were the enemy in 2nd century BC. Then it was Rome. And now at the time of Jesus, they thought the Messiah would come and redeem them from Rome. So all the time they were expecting a Messiah would come and redeem them from, uh, what do you say, the neighboring countries or the country that was in war, in battle with them. So they failed to understand that the real enemy is sin. 